Hi, my name is Justin. I'm the Riparian Specialist and Salmon Watch Coordinator with Mackenzie Watershed Council. I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to Sand Watch 2021. We hope that you enjoy what you see, learn a little something, and hopefully next year we'll see you out on the river. Hi, I'm Bob Bumpstead, a longtime teacher around Eugene and a member of the Sand Watch team since uh, 1993. So, uh, one of the things I love to do is to talk about the qualities of a good riparian area, and I'm going to talk about four qualities a good riparian a good riparian area has and I, I, I try to simplify them and say there, there's two that start with F and there's two that start with S so let's just kind of take them in that order the first F would be a good ripe a good riparian area provides food so to kind of backtrack a little bit a bad riparian area would just be bare ground dirt just rock because in order to provide food for the uh, animals that live in the stream, you need to have trees and bushes. All those things are really important for a good riparian area. So let me explain how a good riparian area with lots of trees and bushes would supply food. One, in the fall, if they're deciduous trees, so those are trees that the leaves fall from it in the fall, those leaves fall into the water. And when they fall into the water, they immediately are a source of food in two ways. One, they grow this kind of bacteria and slime on them, on the leaf, and there are some little aquatic insects called scrapers that come through and actually scrape that, that uh, uh, slime layer off the leaves. It's kind of like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know, that you could just kind of, the, the, the leaf is the toast and they kind of scrape that stuff up. And so that's way, that's one way that they, they um, get food for the insects in the stream. Another way is some of those little insects actually eat webbing of, of the leaf itself. So they're very important for providing food for, for those insects in there. And of course, the insects that eat the food in turn become food for uh, trout and salmon and steelhead, especially the really young ones that are rearing there. So really importantly, if you have trees there and shrubs, they actually uh, provide lots of nutrients in there. In fact, sometimes the, 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 the fish will eat some of those nutrients themselves. Alder trees have little tiny, tiny cones, and there's been reports of the fish eating those little alder cones. So, one really important area of a riparian area is that it provides food through, through not only the leaves, that fall in, but also there's all kinds of, of insects that um, use those, those trees as habitat, and then they they often, when they lay their eggs or something like that, these, these insects you've seen flying around uh, are, become vulnerable to predation by salmon, trout, and steelhead. So a good riparian area has trees and bushes around it that provide food for the aquatic insects and for the uh, fish that live in that area. So that's one thing, that's one F, food. A second F is filtration. So if you think about it, the salmon and steelhead and trout that live in the stream need good, clean gravel. If the gravel gets covered in, a, in any kind of silt and gets silted in, it destroys the value of that because, number one, a lot of insects live in the stream on clean gravel and they are not adapted to living on mud and silt, a lot of them. The second thing is that if, if the gravel get, gets silted in, the fish that like to spawn there and turn that gravel and make a little nest called a red can't utilize that area. And if they do, utilize the area to make a little nest and there's fertile eggs in there, if the silt comes over that, it'll suffocate those eggs. Those eggs need 
dissolved oxygen so 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 that they can grow so it's important that it not get silted over so a good riparian area filters water that's coming down rainwater and that that's that's coming in and uh, it uh, keeps that silt out of the river well so how do they do it well when you look at the trees on on the uh, on the bank we got a lot of nice trees around here those trees uh, when you look at them you think wow those are massive they, they there's really a, a lot of material there well actually there's as much material below the surface of the ground than there is above the surface of the ground. And so all that root material in there is very dense and interlocks with, with uh, uh, the, uh, the feeding parts of, of uh, mushrooms and things like that. It's just, the, the whole ground is just saturated with these intertwined roots in there of all kinds of plants. So, when it rains hard, instead of just washing the soil into the stream, instead it gets trapped by this great root structure in there. So that's why I call that filtration. A good riparian area needs uh, trees and bushes so that their web of roots will keep soil from just flowing into the stream. So that's the first two. Two apps. One is food, one is filtration. So now we come to the S's. And one of the S's that is a characteristic of a good riparian area is shade. Why shade? Why does a stream need to be shaded? Well, it's a simple fact that the colder the water is, the more oxygen it contains. So there's about, the air we're breathing is about 21% uh, oxygen and remains that way whether you're, you're at sea level or up at 10,000 feet. Um, I, <laughs> even at 10,000 feet when you're gasping for, for oxygen, it's the same percentage level. So that's great, but fish and insects through gills need to take the oxygen out of the water and they don't have 21 percent they've got about 10 parts per million so you got a million little dots only 10 of them would be oxygen so that's pretty amazing and the colder the water is the more oxygen uh, it contains there are some fish like a bull trout that can't spawn in water higher than 40 degrees because the eggs need that oxygen and they need that that flow going through. So, the colder the water, the more oxygen it can hold. If the trees shade the stream, then it obviously cools it off. And then they have more oxygen. So, if, if the water gets up above 70 degrees, they're in trouble. They can't get enough oxygen out of the um, water to thrive and grow. Now, this brings up another important point. It's important that the stream and rivers interacts with the land and making and makes small channels. Because if you have a big wide, wide river and you've got trees on the side that shade only 10% of the river, that's not doing much. But if you have, instead of this big wide river, if you have lots of small channels with trees over, especially deciduous trees, which shade the uh, stream in the in the summer from the heat but in the winter they don't have any leaves so the sun gets down to the stream and provides um, energy for plants to grow in the stream and those plants growing in the stream also supply oxygen to the fish so shade kind of equals more shade more oxygen and it's incredibly important that the the that the rivers and streams penetrate a landscape so they can be shaded more. So that's shade. So the next S besides shade is structure. And that's really important. If you just have a stream that is just flowing without any structure to the river, it's gonna flow like a little chute. And, and, the, and, and the current is all gonna be the same. 
And that doesn't work for fish and insects because some fish need, uh, all fish need slow water where they can rest and fast water where they can grab the food coming down. And some insects don't want fast water at all. They want slow water. To, so to provide for a, re, for a variety of life forms, what you have to have is the water going at different speeds. And so if a tree falls in the river, it does all kinds of neat things. Above the, where the tree flows, it creates a pool because some insects and fish at some times like nice slow water. If the, if the tree doesn't completely block the river, the water has to go around it. And when it goes around in a restricted area, then it'll just have to go faster. And so, so that provides a, a, a pool up above, fast water going around it, and importantly, if water goes over a log falling in, then it digs out a little hole there and it makes a nice pool there. So that's important. Also, if a tree falls in, it brings food with it because a lot of insects can, can uh, hang around that and it, it provides habitat for not only insects, but it also helps the fish to hide them from predators. There are a lot of things that like to eat fish. You know, there's all kinds of birds, there's ospreys and there's blue herons and there's kingfishers and all kinds of things like that. They want to eat little fish. So um, if, if they have a place they can hide where wood falls into the water, for structure it's also important that you have a variety of types of trees. A lot of the trees that, that grow right near the bank are deciduous. So their their leaves drop off. As I said before, they're really great. They shade it in the summer and the winter they, they let the light in. But when those trees like alder fall into the river, they don't last very long, so they provide structure, but they don't last that long. What you really want are conifers, which around here is, is basically Douglas fir and cedar. When they fall into a stream, they last a long time. I've probably been rowing a drift boat on these rivers for 50 years, and there's still logs in the river that I rowed around in 1970. So they really provide and anchor that structure. That's the reason why uh, there are pretty strict laws about cutting any conifer, a Douglas fir or a cedar, within a certain length of the stream, because that's what you really want to fall into the stream to, to uh, actually provide lasting structure. One more important thing about logs falling into a stream, besides providing different water uh, types and also giving protections to, to fish is that is, is something that a lot of people don't really think about and that is water is not the only item flowing down a stream. Another type of thing that flows down the stream is gravel. You think about that rocks fall in the stream up high in the reach of a stream where it's where it's generally fast and, and uh, those rocks fall in and they tumble. That's why all river rocks are round. They have been tumbled round. And it falls, the, the, gravel, the gravel falls into the stream from upstream and it gets tumbled down and tumbled down and tumbled down. The fish need that gravel and that, that gravel will just wash out of the stream unless there are some impediments, some structure in there. So if a log falls across the stream, it, 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 it traps the gravel and it sorts it. The, gra the, the uh, gravel that falls out in the kind of slow areas is often kind of uh, small uh, gravel. The gravel that, go that, that, that uh, falls into the stream that in the fast area generally larger water. For instance, trout need small little gravel to spawn. Salmon need bigger gravel to provide more kind of interstices between the, the uh, rocks so that the um, eggs can um, hatch out and have enough room to move around a little bit and move up through the gravel. So when a log falls across a stream, 
it traps that really important gravel. This is especially important in streams that were logged hundreds of years or hundred years ago, maybe even 50 years ago, by a technique called splash damming, where the loggers would build a dam across a creek, maybe eight, nine feet, ten feet high, let the water flow in behind it and make a nice big pond, cut their logs, since they didn't have a good way of getting the logs to uh, market, there weren't a lot of roads that the trucks met back then, weren't as good, there were no helicopters, there was nothing. So the way they got logs to the mill downstream was to float them down. So what they would do is they'd build this dam, make a pond, put the logs in that pond, and then when they had all the logs they wanted in the uh, pond, dynamite the dam. So all of a sudden, this wall of water and logs would come careening down the stream and scrape all the gravel away. So especially in those streams, a lot of them are on the Oregon coast, you need to retain gravel. So it's really important that structure not only changes the water type, gives protection for fish to hide from predators, but also traps the, the uh, gravel coming down the stream. So that's structure, okay? So, I've given you four characteristics of a good riparian area. They all require trees and shrubs. One is shade, and it keeps the water cool so it has more oxygen. oxygen. Another one is structure. The structure we were just talking about gives you different uh, ecosystems in the rivers, slow areas, fast areas, retains a lot of gravel. The trees bring a lot of food for the, the insects and the fish in the river. And uh, then the, the uh, final thing is filtration. <laughs> filtration, keeping all the muck and dirt out of the stream so it doesn't clog up the gravel. So, so two S's, two F's make a good riparian area. One thing about riparian areas, they attract a lot of life. I mean, deer come down, elk come down, all kinds of animals. 90% of, of, of animals, of, of land animals, spend time in a riparian area. Why? Well, there's food there, there's protection. It's really a nice place. And humans are not exempt from that. If you think about the, the uh, number of years that people lived in small tribes, they needed an area that had water. They needed an area that had wood. They need an area that provided protection. And that's kind of sunk into our modern minds too. It hasn't gone away. A lot of people talk about that people are suffering from nature deficit. That being out in, in, in the wild world around trees and shrubs and water has a really calming effect on us. Makes us much more connected to the natural world and our, our brains are attuned to that natural world. So especially the sound of running water that I hope you can hear in the background here because it's that sound that human beings are really attracted to. In fact, I live in Eugene but I built a waterfall in my front yard so I can hear that sound all the time because it is soothing and healing to us. So not only are riparian areas important for fish and wildlife, they're important for our mental health too. You, you, you can't deny that emotional attraction that we have to these areas. My name's Emma Garner. I'm the Youth Education Coordinator with the Middle Fork Willamette Watershed Council. And today I'm here to talk to you about salmon. There are five species of salmon in Oregon. There are, there are the pink, coho, chinook, sockeye, and chum. Today we're going to focus on the Chinook, which is the largest of the species, and it's out here on the Mackenzie River spawning right now. Now what makes a salmon so different from other fish that you might see in the Mackenzie or rivers in the Upper Willamette? They're anadromous, which means their life cycle starts in freshwater, they migrate out to the ocean as adults where they spend several years growing and maturing, and then they swim back to freshwater to their home streams to spawn. And that is the end of the life cycle for the adults, where their carcasses return to the freshwater system and bring nutrients and 
food to the stream and surrounding fish and wildlife. So the fish that are spawning right now are spring Chinook. And when a spring Chinook salmon, when any salmon shows up to spawn, the female is looking for a very specific habitat type. She's not gonna spawn anywhere in the river. She needs a spot where the water is cool and clean, which you learn from one of the other stations is very important for bringing developing fish oxygen. She needs water that is flowing fast enough to bring that oxygen down into her nest, but not so fast that it's gonna push the eggs out. And she needs gravel that she can move around with her tail to build her nest and shelter those eggs, but not gravel that's so small that it will wash away or will be so big that it's going to crush the eggs. And behind us are great examples of an ideal habitat type for her to build her nest. We have a variety of size of gravel. She would come into this area, an area very similar to what's behind me. And what she's going to do, she's going to settle herself into that gravel and she's gonna push her tail around and sort of start to carve out that nest, which is what we call a red, and it's spelled R-E-D-D. -D. And she's gonna move that gravel around and dig it out. And that can be spotted from land because you'll see an area in the river and all of a sudden there will be an indentation and kind of a clear patch of gravel where all the rock has been moved and cleaned out from her tail. Now while she's doing that and she's building her nest, the surrounding males are competing for a spot to fertilize those eggs. And by competing, they're pushing each other with their tails and their big noses and biting each other with their teeth. And either a male is going to win that battle or it's gonna sneak through and swim alongside the female. And when she turns on her belly, she's gonna push her tail around and deposit those eggs deep into the gravel and he's going to swim next to her and turn over and deposit his sperm and fertilize those eggs in the gravel. And that will start the development stage and the next generation of salmon. The eggs in the red are about the size of a pea and she can lay anywhere between two and 5,000 eggs at a time. Now, when the eggs are freshly laid in the gravel, they're at this stage, which is called a zygote stage. And then once they're fertilized, you notice that it looks like there's a little sprinkling of pepper flakes on them. Those are the eyes developing, and those are called the eyed eggs, and they'll be at this stage for 40 to 50 days still in the gravel, still finding protection in the red. The next stage is called Alevin, and if Alevin is as hard for you to say as it is me, um, you can also call them sack fry, which describes this life stage perfectly because as you can see, they hold onto their yolk sac on their stomachs. At this stage, they're still very vulnerable to predators. Their bodies are not fully developed, and they could easily be prey to wildlife and other fish. So they're gonna stay protected in that red and they're gonna rely on that yolk sac to absorb those essential nutrients that they need to continue to develop. Once their yolk sac is completely absorbed, so after a couple months, they're gonna become swim up fry. And when they're swim up fry, they're about the size of your pinky um, and they'll continue to develop in size. And this is when they will lose that pink color and they will gain spots and stripes up their side called par marks. And that's gonna help them blend into the surrounding environment. Because as fry, they're emerging from the red and they're going to re rely on the habitat that the stream is providing them to continue to find shelter from predators and to continue to swim in a safe, protected space where they can feed and grow and develop. So behind me, the habitat might look a little bit different than what you're familiar with, with a fresh, lush, green stream. And that's because we're in a restoration site. 
in a restoration site, professionals have worked to add logs and change the shape of the shape of the stream channel to enhance the stream health and bring more habitat in for fish and surrounding wildlife. One key piece that we see everywhere around us are these placed logs. And you can think if you're a tiny little fry and you're swimming around in a stream and you're trying to dart out and feed but not go so far out that you're going to get eaten by another fish or a bird, these logs are going to provide great shelter for you and great habitat. They're also relying on shaded areas where they can stay cool and on calmer, wa and on calmer water areas where they can tuck into the bank and find a nice sheltered place to sort of stay and swim around. So you can see that along the edge around me and along the logs behind me. And once trees start to grow here again, those trees will provide shelter and more logs and more debris for the fish to tuck into. Once those fish are bigger, they're going to swim into even deeper water and they're gonna start their migration downriver into the ocean. When they're swimming out, when they're swimming down to the ocean for their migration, they continue to rely on healthy habitat to find shelter and food sources while avoiding predators. And they continue to get bigger and they continue to grow. Now you can imagine, right before you get into the ocean, if you've spent almost a year in freshwater, it's a huge shock to your body and your system to all of a sudden be swimming in salt water. So these fish are gonna take a little pause in their migration and they're gonna hang out in a place that we call an estuary. An estuary is where fresh water meets salt water. And this is gonna give the fish time for their body chemistry to change and then to physically change so they're ready to live a nice adult life in the ocean. One of the most noticeable changes is they lose those stripes and those spots that we come to know that they have to blend into freshwater habitat. And they're gonna become bright and silver and develop these shiny silver scales so they can blend into the ocean habitat. This process is called smultification and the fish emerging from the estuary and swimming out into the ocean are called smolts. Once they're in the ocean, they're going to spend several years swimming as a school, continuing to grow and continuing to feed. And they can swim anywhere from the south coast of California all the way up to the northernmost bays of Alaska. They're avoiding predators like seals, killer whales, humans who are fishing for them. And depending on what species of salmon we're talking about, they'll spend a different amount of time in the ocean. Chinook salmon will spend anywhere between three and five years in the ocean before coming back to spawn. Salmon have a very special set of senses that help them know when it's time to return to spawn and where they need to spawn. And they're not looking for any river to spawn in. They're going to zero in on the stream that they were born in, their home stream. We also call this their natal stream. They're gonna use their sense of smell to direct them and guide them back up into fresh water to where they can spawn. They'll go through another set of physical changes when entering the fresh water. They'll lose that bright silver color that helps them blend in so well and they'll turn to deep coppers and reds and browns so they can once again blend into the freshwater habitat around them. They'll also stop feeding and store all of their energy and everything that they have so they can push upstream and use their strength as swimmers to make it above human-made dams and animal-made dams so they can get back to their home stream to spawn. There aren't any adult fish around me right now, but if we take a quick pause and a quick trip, I can take you to see uh, adult salmon and we can talk about what they look like. So of those two to 5,000 eggs, roughly one to 2% return to spawn as adults. So behind us, we have a very special sighting of two adult salmon that have made their way all the way back up to spawn. Now, 
We'll give them a little bit of time to swim back in, but some things to think about when you're looking at these fish. When salmon are in the ocean, they're bright and chrome and silver so they can blend in. And their noses are very round and streamlined so they can swim fast and cut through the water. When salmon return to fresh water, not only do they change in color, but their physical characteristics, their, the shape of them changes as well. The male's nose will come out and, and hook down and sort of create this larger hooky nose that we call a kite. And they'll develop these really big teeth that they use to fight each other and bite each other to compete for that spot to spawn. The female will maintain the softness of that nose, but she'll, she'll still be a darker color. And something specific to the females, as you'll see in the fish behind me, she spent so much time building that red and moving gravel around that her tail is more degraded than the rest of her body. Because as adult salmon swim back up into fresh water and spawn, their bodies slowly break down as part of the end of their life. The females will break down more on their tails. So when you see a salmon in a river or a stream and you see that white flesh on their tail and on their belly, it's probably a good bet it's a female. And if you see more decay on their back and on their sides and you see that hooked nose, it's probably a good bet that it's a male. These salmon behind me have probably spawned already. You'll notice that the female is swimming a little slow and a little tired, so she's nearing the end of her life cycle. And once that's done, like I mentioned before, their bodies will stay in the stream and wash down river, and they'll give nutrients to the soil, food to surrounding fish and wildlife, and important nutrients to other bugs and surrounding critters that will feed the next generation of salmon. So before we leave these salmon, I have some questions that were sent in from Agnes Stewart Middle School that I want to get some answers to. Someone asked if there are any predators to salmon eggs. And I had mentioned that there are predators and that's the importance of them hiding in those reds until they're big enough to swim out. Some of the predators are other species of fish that will swim downstream of the female while she's laying, while she's building that nest and depositing those eggs, and they'll swim in and they'll sneak an egg here and there and they'll scoop them out. They'll also, there are also predators in birds and surrounding wildlife that may come in and dig the rocks out and find those nutrient dense eggs. So that is why it's critical and important for the female to have just the perfect rock size and the perfect stream habitat so she can protect those fish and build a really safe red. Someone asked a great question, how do salmon fill their bodies with water when they're spawning? Salmon don't fill their bodies with water when they're spawning, but they do take water into, into their gills and they push it over their gills. They have these really soft, delicate gills that you can see on the side of their head. And there's hard tissue that covers it and protects it, and that's called the operculum. And what they do is they pump that operculum cover over their gills and it pushes the water over the gills, and that's how they get oxygen. Now salmon might not fill their bodies with water when they're spawning, but fish will fill their bodies with air while they're swimming around. And that is done through something called an air bladder. And they will take little gulps of air and fill their body with air, and that lets them swim in different columns of the water. So a fish can swim really deep down in a cool, dark pool, but if they see some really tasty snacks or something that they want to prey on towards the surface, they can um, collect more air in that bladder and they'll swim up and they can change where they swim in the water system. Does salmon ever get lost on their way to spawning grounds? That is a great question, and yes they do. Well, salmon, well, the natural cycle for a salmon is to return to the stream that they were that they hatched in their natal stream, their home stream, that doesn't always happen. And sometimes that can just be the reason of a fish getting confused on its way up and it ducks into a side channel or it finds really good habitat further downstream. And sometimes that's influenced by things that are outside of the control of a fish. If the water is too low for the fish to swim up the river, 
if the water quality is not healthy enough for the fish to swim and build the red and deposit those eggs, that could be through murky water, through really warm water, through slow oxygenated water, or if there's just a different scent cue that throws them off. Sometimes salmon will swim into a stream that's a hundred miles away from their home stream. And we call those strays. And when, when a salmon comes from a hatchery, we put a little tag in their nose and that tells us what hatchery they came from and when they were released. And so when salmon spawn and die on, spawn, on, on spawning sites and scientists hike through the sites to survey them, they can scan that tag and they can find out what hatchery that fish came from so we can have an estimated number for the number of strays, which is a pretty cool way to monitor that. And the last most important question, why are salmon important to the earth? They're just as important to the earth as the same reason any living being is important to the earth. They're part of the natural system. They're part of this great cycle. They've been here before any humans have been here. And without a salmon, that web of connectedness for healthy habitat and predator and prey and a thriving ecosystem, it starts to fall apart. They bring nutrients and food to a system. They enrich it with their presence and their carcasses. And they're just part of a broad life cycle of everything interacting together to keep each other alive.